Hello everybody, it's Mrs. Ware of Stream English here and today I'm going to be talking to you about one of the texts in the Edexcel IGCSE language anthology called Explorers or Boys. Now you need to know this text for your language exam because it's one of the ones that could come up in the language exam for question number four. So what I'm going to be doing is talking you through all the different ideas you could potentially analyse in this text so that you're able to handle any kind of question that comes up. One side note, I know I've got a messier background than usual with, you know, the blanket and things, but Fidget fell asleep on it and I couldn't bring myself to wake her up just to tidy up my house. So apologies for the mess. One of the interesting things about this exam paper, or terrifying to look at it another way, is that it hasn't actually had many physical exams sat at all because of the pandemic. What that means is that we really haven't had much of a chance to see the kinds of potential questions you can get for all the different texts because of course they haven't even had a chance to examine anywhere near all of them. That being said, there are some trends and patterns from the exams that we've had so far that we can see and that is that question four seems to always be about the writer of that text and what they think, what they feel and how they present what they have experienced. Now in the case of this text, the writer wasn't actually there. He is a journalist reporting on it after the fact. And so he can't really talk about his experiences or anything like that. And also because he is a journalist, he's not really supposed to be in it at all. It's supposed to be objective journalism, but I'll talk about more of that in a minute. Instead, it's supposed to be he is presenting an experience somebody else had. This is not objective journalism. It's supposed to be, and I'll show you how I know it's supposed to be. I went and found the article on The Guardian's website in their archive and you can see that they categorised this article under UK News. Now, there are two kinds of journalism. There's objective factual journalism and then there is opinion journalism. And opinion journalism is meant to be biased, somebody's giving their opinion. Objective factual journalism is supposed to be relaying the news, is supposed to do it in a neutral, unbiased way. Of course, the reputation of tabloids in particular is that they are still really biased in all the news they present and they really manipulate language. But I would argue that Explorers or Boys is also an example of biased journalism, where even though it is presented as a factual piece informing us about an event, it is absolutely using language to manipulate its audience into thinking a certain way, into presenting the event in a certain way. In that sense, we can absolutely talk about what the writer thinks because our writer is trying to present a certain viewpoint, they're just doing it very subtly. They're never gonna say, I think this or I think that. It's all about looking at the way they present the situation and the way they present the situation is essentially what they think about the situation, in other words. So if we think about how they present these people in Explorers or Boys, there's two sides. First of all, there's the Explorers themselves, Steve Brooke and Quentin Smith. And they are presented as immature and reckless. And as usual, I've used my beloved Collins Dictionary to provide the definitions of those two words for you there as well. Conversely, the other group that really comes up a lot in this article are the people that rescued them. The people involved in the military um, and those who really know about these kinds of things, these kinds of helicopters and going out in the sea and all that kind of stuff. And they are presented as being competent and experienced. So there's also a huge contrast going on the whole way through between our immature and reckless people who got stuck and lost and needed saving versus the competent and experienced people who saved them. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on analysing, how our writer presents them this way because that is essentially what our writer thinks about them. The other thing we have to consider is, you know, why has the writer presented them this way? Of course, yes, it's what the writer thinks, but there is also an angle to it because, of course, the writer is not engaging in objective journalism. And when a writer doesn't engage in objective journalism, you have to think about why they would do that. What's the news angle for them here? Sometimes it's going to be political, like they're wanting to present a certain political party in a positive way and a certain political party in a negative way. Other times it's that they're trying to push a certain idea 
career forward that they want their audience to agree with, or they're just generally trying to like influence the audience in a particular way. And that's what our article here is doing. Because of course, our writer, part of their purpose of their writing is not just to inform, but also to entertain. And so our writer is simultaneously trying to meet those purposes of informing and entertaining our audience. Now, when students hear entertain, they immediately think that must mean like constant joy and happiness. That's not how he's entertaining his audience. He's entertaining them by filling them with righteous anger, as well as also completely mocking and making the uh, people who got stuck seem completely ridiculous as well. So it's like this balance between anger and comedy that he's constantly towing the line of for his audience, making them angry, then making them laugh, making them angry, then making them laugh at the kind of ridiculousness of the situation. That need for him to want to inform and entertain is feeding into part of why he presents them that way as well. Let's start going through the actual article itself and looking at what we can analyze to prove all of these ideas. In terms of what we're going to analyze, we're going to start off with the title of the article because of course the headline of a news article is the key initial way that a journalist can draw their reader in into wanting to read the article. And it's really important in foregrounding not only the key events of what the article is about, but also setting the tone um, of what kind of article this is going to be. And the headline of Explorers and Boys does that in spades. So if we start off with the um, rhetorical question, explorers or boys messing about. You've of course here got a juxtaposition between the words explorers and boys. While explorers has connotations of skill and adventure and someone very sort of maybe professional and sophisticated, boys has connotations of being childish, of being irresponsible, of being underdeveloped, of being immature. It also has that colloquial language messing about as well. It's not just boys, it's boys messing about. So it again is really important in creating that sense of them being immature and irresponsible, as I said before, because of that juxtaposition, which are they? And so it's almost setting up this question as if that's what the article is gonna explore. The article is going to explore the answer to that question. Are they explorers or are they boys messing about? So this would engage our audience because of course, it's giving them the opportunity for them to make up their minds. In theory, in reality, the writer is heavily pushing us, in our opinion, to go for the boys messing about side of things. But in theory, what's pulling our readers in is the question and offering them the opportunity to decide their answer. There is also though, a really clever technique where I'm actually, honestly, I'm not sure if this has a name. My initial instinct was hyperfora, which is where you ask a question and then immediately answer it. But I haven't put hyperfora on my presentation because I wasn't 100% convinced that the next bit he says is an answer as opposed to just another thought. Regardless though, that either way, is really important in creating a dismissive tone because it, essentially he's also saying that question I just put forward doesn't really matter, right? Either way, regardless of which side you settle on, doesn't matter. Either way, the taxpayer gets the rescue bill. So he places the focus and emphasis on the consequence of what they have done. That wording, taxpayer gets the rescue bill, is very emotive for our audience. So if we look at why, there's a few reasons. Taxpayer gets rescue bill. I would say there's three different techniques that are all happening at the same time and combining together to make our audience feel pretty darn angry. The first is the use of that word taxpayer. If we think about our audience of the Guardian newspaper, they are likely to be adults, who pay taxes and therefore that word of taxpayer has an emotional connection for our audience because they feel like that noun could be used to refer to them. What's also more effective about it though is that it's been worded as taxpayer singular and that use of the singular noun makes it feel as if our person reading this is almost like the only person who's going to be paying the bill, which is of course not true. You have that combined with the present tense of gets, which makes it feel very in the moment, like it's happening right then and there. So for our audience reading this article, article for the very first time, there is an immediate sense of an economic impact on them personally. 
And finally, there's the use of the description of it as a rescue bill. Now that is a technique called metonymy. Metonymy is basically where you refer to something by naming it after an object very closely related to it. So for example, when you're talking about the monarchy, you might call them the crown, because we think about kings and queens always having a crown. Here, we are talking about, if we were to stretch it out in long words, the financial cost of rescuing people. But it has all been condensed down into a bill. Vi that visual image of almost being handed, a, like this is how much something costs, being handed a bill. And it's much more everyday understandable imagery. Again, taxpaying adults are going to be very familiar with having to pay bills. So for our audience reading this, the combination of those three things makes it feel immediate, makes it feel personal and makes it feel like this is having a detrimental impact on their lives, that on an economic impact on their lives. So Stephen Morris, just in his headline, has first of all begun to foreground this idea of our uh, people who needed rescuing, Steve Brooks and Quentin Smith, as being irresponsible and childish and also trying to manipulate his audience already into that sense of anger around the consequences of what they have done. And you could perhaps argue that the reason why he's trying to build anger in his audience is that that is reflective of his own perspective. He's angry, get on the boat with him, join him in his anger. The next thing we're going to do is start talking about the actual main body of the article itself. Now, there is a subheading to this article, and the way it's presented in the anthology doesn't make that super clear. The line, adapted from an article published in the Guardian newspaper 28 January 2003, that's Edexcel explaining where they've got the article from. Helicopter duo plucked from life raft after Antarctic crash, that is actually the article. That is the subheading of this article. That part is up for analysis because Stephen Morris wrote that, not Edexcel. And subheadings are in articles all about adding a little bit of extra detail about the news event, again designed to entice the reader into continue reading. Now what I've said so far is very generic, so let's make it much more interesting and specific to this article. What is the subheading doing here? Helicopter duo plucked from life raft after Antarctic crash. There, it's a case of looking at word choices. You've got the verb plucked, which I'm going to talk about in more detail later as being quite a kind of ridiculous image there um, that you wouldn't normally um, use for people. You've got the words like life raft, crash, and helicopter creating a sense of adventure. And you've got, then got Antarctic, also creating a sense of adventure, but also like some risks, some danger. So by adding in these extra details in its subheading of helicopter duo plucked from life raft after Antarctic crash, Stephen Morris is simultaneously adding a bit more detail, building up interest in the article by making it sound quite thrilling and exciting, and also managing to get in another little dig at our explorers or boys uh, with that verb of plucked and making them sound a little bit ridiculous there. Going on to the next actual main paragraphs of how we open though, there's a lot of really interesting things going on here. So first of all, I wanna talk about the semantic field of nationalities plus listing, plus the time reference that all create a scale of the trouble cause. That is the first goal in this opening, is he is trying to highlight the scale of trouble that these two caused. So that semantic field of nationalities, you've got the reference to Russians, you've got the British, you've got Chilean as well. So three different nationalities across three different paragraphs. So that makes it seem like they must have caused huge trouble for so many different nationalities that if you think geographically, South America, Western Europe and you know what I'm not even gonna lie I don't even know how to categorize Russia geographically because it's so darn huge so far apart so different but all having to come together to help save these guys it really raises questions of what did they do you also have a listing of military institutions so you have that with royal navy the raf and british coast guards when you're analyzing a list you always want to analyze the range in the list and so here it's not just a list of three different military institutions it's three very different military institutions navy is your boats raf 
is your planes, coast guards, okay fine, there's also boats, but a very different task to the navy. So and that when that semantic field of nationalities combines with our tricolon listing of Royal Navy, the RAF and British Coast Guards, suddenly it creates an even bigger scale of how much trouble they caused because of how many different groups were needed to help get them out of their trouble. The final thing is the time reference. I, you can call it time reference, you could also say the fact as well, because it is a fact, and that is that it was a nine hour rescue. That reference to time there of nine hours, that fact that it took nine hours, is a long time. And so again, scale of trouble. Loads of people were needed from across the world, quite literally, for a long period of time. But the other thing that's going on is about mocking the people who needed rescuing in the first place. So there is also a semantic field of ridicule. And we get that very clearly from words like farce. So a farce is a humorous play. Uh, this, by the way, is another definition from Collins Dictionary in which the characters become involved in complica complicated and unlikely situations. So by calling this situation a farce, it's literally saying, you know, it was really funny because of how ridiculous everything was. Really important in that semantic field of ridicule. Other things that go into it is use of verbs like plucked and plunged. They create quite comical imagery with those verbs because they seem really lighthearted and quite silly compared to the severity of the situation they're being used to talk about. Now this idea of the whole situation being a farce that gets set up in the very uh, opening line of the article is actually continued throughout the article. There are, as we're going to see later on, more use of words that continue this idea of it being like a play, of it being like almost like a silly action film where they've gotten themselves into a really ridiculous situation. We're on to the next chunk now. The first thing we're going to talk about is something that continues from our previous chunk of paragraphs as well. And that is how our writer stirs that indignation, that righteous anger in our audience over what these explorers have done. And he does that by creating a large scale, plus ambiguity, plus multiple nationalities, and plus taxpayers plural. So let me break down for you what I mean by all of that. Starting with the large scale. We get told that it costs tens of thousands of pounds. That is very, very clear for our audience in terms of being a huge economic impact, that large number there. However, it's also a very ambiguous number. There's a big, big difference between, let's say, the lowest you could go of £10,000 and the highest you could go of £99,999. Big difference between those two numbers. And so actually, by leaving that ambiguity, it allows the reader to almost imagine for themselves, create their own number of how high it must be on the scale. That may or may not be accurate to how much it actually cost. It may have cost £10,001 and and yet the audience, the reader, is imagining 40,000, 60,000, 80,000 in their minds. So that ambiguity allows the anger to build because the audience is left essentially to create their own fuel for the fire of their frustration. You again also have the multiple nationalities reference. So we have it's the taxpayers of Britain and of Chile that are going to be paying for this. So again, the consequences are placed on multiple people, a huge number of people, showing the large scale of the economic cost of what's happened. We have taxpayers again, and it creates all the same effect, like I said before, from the headline, except this time it's taxpayers plural, because it's about creating that large scale of how many people are gonna be paying for this. Of course, the reality is, if it is the taxpayers of all of Britain and all of Chile paying £10,001, then each person individually is paying like nothing. But the way that this is worded is about creating anger by making it feel like a huge amount of money that is having to be paid out by a huge number of people that didn't do anything. It's all 
cost by the men's adventure. Look at that really interesting use of the active voice. The men's adventure had cost. So the active voice is basically when you phrase your sentences as subject, verb, object. Somebody did something to someone. In this case, the somebody is the people who need saving. What they did is cost the taxpayers a lot of money. So it places the blame very clearly on their shoulders. They are responsible. The people of this article, Steve Brooks and Quentin Smith, are directly responsible for the economic consequence that is making our audience feel so angry. All of that is followed by expert opinion. Now this is where we start to have that other idea I was saying about how he juxtaposes and constantly contrasts the immature, irresponsible adventurers against our reliable, responsible rescuers. So if we look at this expert opinion, experts questioned the wisdom of taking a small helicopter, the four-seater Robinson R4 four has a single engine into such a hostile environment. So the language there, the way that that is worded, fits with showing the expertise of our experts because it uses jargon and esoteric language. Now esoteric language means language that's only going to be fully appreciated and understood by, by a small group of people who understand that particular field. So people who use lots of language specific to geography are mainly going to be understood by people who really get geography. Whereas me as an English teacher I probably won't fully appreciate what is being said. And that's what we've got here. So you've got the jargon in 4 c to Robinson R44 has a single engine. I don't know about you, but when I hear Robinson R44, that, that means nothing to me. They could have said it was called the Flibberty Gibbet 65, and I would have been like, cool, because I have don't think I've ever seen a helicopter that up close before or known a helicopter's name before. So that jargon makes them seem really knowledgeable, makes it seem really skillful. And then the hostile environment is that more like esoteric language, that geographical, slightly militaristic way of talking about the nature and what was going on there and why it was a su unsuitable area. All of that expert opinion in making them seem really knowledgeable and really skillful is of course juxtaposed against that they are questioning the wisdom. They are questioning the knowledge and expertise of our adventurers. Clearly the writer is trying to undermine our adventurers by making it seem like they basically made a very bad decision and they did the wrong thing. Another thing that's interesting in the next paragraph is the way that it phrases there was also confusion. There's a vagueness about that. There the writer is actually using the passive voice because we don't know who had the confusion. There's no subject that is clearly having the confusion. Here he's using the passive voice to effect because of course by not assigning it to a particular person, by making it feel quite vague about who was confused, it arguably heightens the impact of that confusion because it makes it perhaps feel like everybody was confused when it could have just been one bloke that uh, he spoke to was confused and everyone else was fine with it. But by leaving it ambiguous, it also leaves it ambiguous about the scale because of course in the previous paragraph he used experts plural. So it makes it feel as if lots of people who are really in the know and really knowledgeable about, the, knowledgeable about these things didn't understand what they were doing. That's conveyed as well within this paragraph with the use of the verb claims. Now on the one hand, the journalist is using claims because he hasn't been able to assert it for fact. It's a classic move used by journalists because you know they need to distinguish when something is someone's opinion versus a concrete fact and here the website is not concrete fact is what they said they were going to do. So claim does make sense. However, because of the connotation of the word claim suggesting that the reality is not what you say it is, it serves to also considering everything else that's been set up to this point undermine the reliability of our adventurers and make it seem like they are not as certain and knowledgeable as our experts because of course the word claim is being used for our adventurers which makes it sound like they don't really know what they're on about it's not factual whereas with our experts there is a lot more clear-cut fact there things like the four-seater Robinson R44 has a single engine sounds very definite that jargon sounds very factual and official you also have them quoting the website with trusty helicopter now the reason it's got quotes around it is because it's a phrase taken directly from the source and therefore they have to quote it however with everything that we've seen so far 
far of the way that we've had that semantic field of ridicule, here the quotation marks around trusty helicopter feel ironic because of course it wasn't trusty, they had to be rescued. And therefore the quotation marks feel sarcastic. And it's like our writer is trying to again cast doubt on their reliability. They thought this helicopter was trusty and clearly it was not. And this has come immediately after our paragraph of experts questioning the wisdom, and that is therefore juxtaposing and really juxtaposing the expertise and knowledge of our experts versus the naivety, the arrogance perhaps, the misgivings of our adventurers. They get undermined some more in the next paragraph because you get a quote from Ms. Vesti, one of the adventurers' wives, where she says she did not know what the pair were up to, describing them as boys messing about with a helicopter. Now that language of what are they up to? Very colloquial and of course as is boys messing about as we've already talked about. So that use of colloquial language creates quite a childish imagery. What are you two up to over there? It's very very childish imagery and so it serves as part of that continued image of making our adventurers seem immature. The effect of that is also heightened by the source of this quote being uh, Mr. Vesti's wife, making it feel really personal as well, someone who would know him really well. So the fact that somebody who would know him really well makes him seem really immature makes our audience think, well, clearly this impression of them must be correct. If the wife thinks that, they must just be really immature and unreliable people. In the next paragraph, we have a continuation of the farce imagery that we talked about before, because we have the use of the word drama, the drama. Now, of course, yes, it is literally a drama, everything that's going on, but drama also has echoes of a play, like the farce. You also have the word tragedy used in the previous section that we looked at. So drama, tragedy, farce, all around this idea of it being a kind of comical, but also serious situation. We do also have a fact that very conveniently adds to the farce, and that is that Quentin is also known as as Q, creating there um, an allusion to the James Bond films. Now, of course, that is farcical because Q is like this amazing spy and super intelligent and skillful and experienced and knowledgeable. This bloke got stuck and had to be rescued and nearly died. So the irony of him being called Q and the connotations of that character Q from the James Bond films and novels versus the reality of Quentin Smith is comical, shall we say. The farce is also conveyed with what's happening in this really brilliant juxtaposition between the extremity of the situation and then the everyday mundanity of life. So it's like, on the one hand, they are ditched in the sea, 100 miles off Antarctica, 36 miles north of Smith Island. So there's this real, like, seriousness in the situation. On the other hand, he calls his wife in London and it's like, can you call? Can you call the emergency services for me, love? Um, that image of him having to call his wife. Similarly, he had a wedding present on him that he used to express the distress signals. A watch he got as a wedding present is being used to um, convey the distress signals. So that juxtaposition between just like a bloke's watch being used for distress signals and a bloke being stuck in the sea and, oh, wife, can you call the emergency services? That's part of what's creating that fast imagery in this section. Another thing you have going on in these paragraphs, in addition to the fast imagery, is that fact of their ages. We are told that uh, Mr. Brooks is 42 and Quentin Smith is 40 years old. Now this is pretty classic in newspaper articles for them to give the ages of people involved in a particular accident or whatever, and that's pretty normal but his positioning of when he chooses to do it is very effective. Because of course the age of 42 and 40, that connotes maturity. But he's placed those images in the paragraphs where we really had it set up already that they're quite immature and irresponsible. And it is in the paragraphs with the farce imagery as well. So those connotations of their ages and their maturity are massively being juxtaposed against that farce imagery. I've just realized, by the way, I've talked about juxtap juxtaposition a huge amount. If you're not familiar with what that is, I have got a video that explains, so go have a look. Same goes for um, illusion as well. I've got a video on that too. 
The final thing I would say that's a much smaller thing going on in these paragraphs, but also is part of cr making them seem really ridiculous, is the use of the verb scrambled. They scrambled into their life draft. It makes them just seem really ill-prepared. It makes, it adds to that fast imagery as well. So within everything we've talked about so far, our audience are getting angry again, because not only is the Breitling em emergency watch a part of that everyday mundanity, it also suggests these people are rich, as is the fact that they have a helicopter. They have a helicopter, they have a very nice watch. So the connotations that these are wealthy people combines with the ridicule of them, combines with the severity of the situation. And you know what, actually something else I've just thought of, combines with the knowledge of how much money this has cost and the economic consequences, our audience is getting angry again. You wanna talk about something that's gonna make a taxpayer angry? Them having to pay for a rich man doing something stupid. That's gonna make people angry. And our writer knows that, and our writer is playing on that. Next section, it starts off by talking about what our military did. And here is where we have that shift back to the presentation of competence and experience with a semantic field of expertise with words like deciphered, coordination, surveying, dispatched, steaming. All of these words suggest at people who are skilled, who are knowledgeable, who are efficient, who are effective. And that is all being used to talk about the uh, Royal Navy and the RAF who are coming to save our rescuers. I would also say, this is just a little thing, but um, this metaphor of one of the uh, ships that were sent to go get them being driven back because of poor visibility, I think that is also part of the positive portrayal of our rescuers because it is creating the adversity that even they faced. They struggled in their attempt to rescue, but still tried to go and rescue them, even though in the end it was a Chilean nail vessel that picked them up. They still tried to go and rescue them. I think that use of the word steaming is worth an extra look as well, not just from the perspective of it being part of the semantic field of expertise and showing their efficiency. It also is in the present continuous tense. So it creates a sense of their immediate response, fast, immediate, efficient response in what they are doing. So it adds to that feel of them being really competent. All of that information is followed up by more expert opinion. Though the pair wore survival suits and the weather at the spot where they ditched was clear, one Antarctic explorer told Mr. Brooks's wife it was nothing short of a miracle that they had survived. So the nothing short of a miracle is our expert opinion. Now that expert opinion combines with the information about survival suits and the weather being clear, which both have connotations of safety. And that combines together to make it feel like this situation was avoidable. They had the safety in place. Everything was clear and they had their survival suits. And yet they managed to get themselves into a point where they nearly died. It was nothing short of a miracle that they survived. This shouldn't have been the serious situation that it was. And yet it was a really serious situation, which would suggest that they had done something reckless in order to get themselves from a position of relative safety in clear weather and survival suits to being in a position of, it's a miracle they survived. Now you'd think the fact that it says they wore survival suits would make them seem like they are knowledgeable and experienced and they know what they're doing. And that is what it seems like this next chunk is supposed to do as well but I'm gonna show you how it's not like it seems. So this next chunk gives us background information on Mr. Brooks and Mr. Smith, and it aims to use a lot of facts to establish a pattern of their behavior. Essentially, they're presented as like adventurous people who do a lot of different scary, risky, dangerous things. Now, you could perhaps argue that this is about suggesting they do have knowledge and they do have skill. However, I feel like the way that it is worded, actually the adventures that are talked about all have connotations of risk and eccentricity that instead just adds the idea of them being immature and reckless. For example, trekked solo to Everest base camp. Who does that? Who goes on their own? Walked barefoot for three days in the Himalayas. Who goes barefoot up a mountain? Survived a charge by a silverback gorilla. Who's going near a superback gorilla? What are you doing? 
leave the gorilla alone. So the multiple facts, the multiple examples of things that they have done serve to basically establish that pattern that these are reckless people. They do adventurous but also reckless things. On the other hand, we do actually also get some facts that are about suggesting they do have knowledge and skill. So him being a qualified mechanical engineer and pilot, that's someone who should be able to fly a helicopter. But at this point, with all the other information we've had, because from a structural analysis perspective, we have to think about that order, right? And what our writer has done is just set this up as a completely avoidable situation. So when we then get the information that he does have knowledge and skill, Brooks does, we're just even angrier. We're just even more annoyed because it makes us feel like, come on, man, you should have known better. You should have not been so reckless. You're an engineer. You're a pilot. You should have known what you were doing. So by not giving us this information about Brooks, or Smith until much later in the article, until he's been able to establish them as being immature and reckless by experts. By the time we get to find out their expertise, it's been completely undermined. And if anything, it just makes us think they're even more stupid and reckless for doing something when they should have known better. The same happens, just to talk briefly about the facts that we have for Mr. Smith, the same happens here. Claims to have been flying since the age of five. Now the word claims is gonna have all the same effect I talked about earlier, the age of five. That fact is about making it seem like he should have been experienced, he should have known what he was doing. Same goes for the fact about twice flying a helicopter around the globe and winning a championship. All of those facts are about showing essentially he should have had knowledge and skill to avoid this situation. And therefore it is just even more ridiculous that they ended up in this situation that establishing a pattern continues in this last line of this chunk as well. Despite the, their experience, it is not the first time they've hit the headlines for the wrong reasons. Hit the headlines is a classic line used in newspaper articles. It has connotations of infamy. That means you're well known for a bad reason. So it's like our adventurers have done things before that are immature and reckless and reckless enough to get them in the newspapers. There's also clearly bias, pejorative bias language in that adjective of wrong reasons as well. Last chunk. So what's interesting about the first paragraph of this chunk is that again our writer seems to be presenting them as quite powerful and impressive. So Mr Brooks and another explorer, Graham Stratford, were poised, that makes them sound very like elegant and sophisticated, to become the first to complete a crossing of the 56 mile wide frozen Bering Strait between the US and Russia. Fact that seems very impressive. In an amphibious vehicle, Snowbird 6, jargon making them seem very skillful and knowledgeable, which could carve its way through ice and flows and float in the water in between. That dynamic verb, carve, creating a sense of skill and impressiveness and power as well. However, all of that is juxtaposed by the next paragraph. But they were forced to call a halt after the Russian authorities told them they would scramble military helicopters to lift them off the ice if they crossed the border. The power and impressiveness of their adventure is juxtaposed against the military power of Russia. And it's something about that verb, lift them off the ice. It sounds so simple and easy. And also I would say the phrasing of it, lift them, like the military helicopters would lift them, makes it feel like it's lifting the actual people. So creates this rather ridiculous image of our mind, almost of like Russian authorities just being like, nope, no you don't, and picking them up and dropping them off somewhere else. And so it completely undermines all of that power and impressiveness they've had and makes them seem just a little bit pathetic, to be honest, in the face of true power and true authority of the Russian military. They're also made in the next paragraph to seem really naive. So first of all, this paragraph begins with the word ironically, immediately setting it up with a sarcastic mocking tone. So of course there's been loads of mocking tone throughout this and there has been some sarcasm already. And so this is just a kind of continuation of that. And it tells us that one of the aims of the expedition was to demonstrate how good relations between East and West have become. Now this makes them seem really naive because of the synecdoche of East and West. Now synecdoche is a very similar technique to metonymy. 
but it's where you refer to something by a part of it and use that part to represent the whole. So in the case of the huge number of different countries that make up Eastern Europe, Russia, Asia, it just refers to them as the East. Similarly, the huge range of countries that make up North America, Western Europe, are just called the West. And the reason it does that, the reason it refers to it as East and West is because of the connotations of an incredibly long and complex political history. Our audience, again, as readers of The Guardian, we can assume would be familiar with this concept. You know, they're reading The Guardian. They must read it on other days too and be familiar with this political history. It makes them seem really naive. Like they essentially like they thought they could you know, create world peace by driving Snowbird 6 through some ice. So it's part of that mocking them and it mocks them by making them seem naive. Another continued technique we have is the expert opinions. So again, the wisdom, that exact word wisdom has already been used there. The wisdom of the team's latest adventure was questioned by. So what they're literally questioning by using that abstract noun wisdom what they're literally questioning is the knowledge and skill and experience of the adventurers that's why he's using that word wisdom it is really about questioning their knowledge and experience and here we get a specific reference to who the expert is now sometimes he hasn't specified the expert he's left it vague at experts and that's part of how he is making it feel like loads of people are all in agreement about how ridiculous it is. But also sometimes the writer refers to specific people and uses those specific people to hammer home his point too. In this case, we've got someone who is the editor of Jane's Helicopter Markets and Systems. In other words, somebody who really knows helicopters. And we've got a direct quotation from them. I'm surprised they use the R44. I wouldn't use a helicopter like that to go so far over the sea. It sounds as if they were pushing it to the maximum. So our expert opinion, as we've already said with all the others, is about undermining the knowledge and experience of our adventurers and making them seem reckless in their decisions. It then takes a quote from the adventurers themselves, literally a single word, but it manages to undermine them some more. It's a spokesman for the pair who said it was not known what had gone wrong. Now, that phrasing, it was not known what had gone wrong, again makes them seem naive and inexperienced because everything we've read up to this point with the multiple expert opinions suggesting that from the outset they should have known this was a bad idea would make it seem like they should have known something wouldn't go right. And they then say the flying conditions have been excellent. Now, of course, our writer did allude to that earlier. They said weather conditions were clear. But when we have that strong laudatory adjective of excellent, it just can't help but contradict everything that the article has said. It seems to contradict everything we have seen about our adventurers in terms of their preparedness and their understanding. And so them saying the weather conditions were excellent, even if perhaps that is true, because of everything that's already been said, it just undermines them further. Worse than that, the way that this is worded, there's no apology. There's no tone of regret. There is just a tone of confusion. And so if we think about our audience's res response, they're gonna be even more angry because it's like, how can you not acknowledge that you messed up? How can you just be like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what happened. There's no taking responsibility there. There is no accepting the mistakes that you've made. You're irresponsible. The next thing we've got going on that again is enhancing our audience's anger is in the next paragraph. The Ministry of Defense said the taxpayer would pick up the bill. We've already talked about the effect created by taxpayer. We've already talked about the effect created by using the bill. But this is also, as a full phrase, picking up the bill is a classic metaphor used, picking up the bill. Again, that metaphor is all about making that economic impact feel personal. Singular taxpayer, that image of a bill and combining with the metaphor of picking it up. It makes the consequences feel real personal. But notice as well, it's hedged in the fact that it is normal in rescues in the UK and abroad. That's typical behavior. But the way that it's phrased 
manages to make us angry. We also have that quote uh, from the spokesperson of the Ministry of Defence saying it was highly unlikely it would recover any of the money. Using those adverbs really just adds salt onto the wound because it's not only is there an economic impact, but things aren't gonna be made better as well. There is no hope for improvement in this situation. The final thing I wanna talk about, again, really important from a structural perspective is that very last line. Again, a quote from Ms. Vesti. They'll probably have their bottoms kicked and be sent home the long way. So just as we had from a quote from her before, the colloquial language, connoting children and the way that you uh, treat children. And that is of course juxtaposed against our sensible military who are coming to pick them up on the HMS endurance. So there's the juxtaposition between the sensible military and the irresponsible middle-aged men. Overall, as I already said way back at the beginning, there is just some clear points that our writer is trying to push forward here. He feels angry perhaps and that is why he's trying to make the audience feel angry he feels that this situation is ridiculous and that is why he's trying to present our adventurers as being irresponsible and immature he also has a lot of respect for the rescuers and that is why he presents them as competent and experienced and we're able to prove all of that from all the different language stuff I've analyzed, but also don't forget the structural comments about the order everything is in, what's foregrounded in our headline and our subheading, the information, the ridicule that is set up prior to getting the facts about the men themselves and the knowledge and experience that they have, the way that it ends on that very last line, all of that. And the key thread running through all the different language techniques we've looked at is the tone, the mocking tone of our adventurers and arguably an angry tone on behalf of the taxpayer because of the economic consequences of what these adventurers have done. All the things I've talked through today are really going to help you with getting full marks in that question four. However, the reality is you're not gonna be able to achieve that unless you know how to write it all out, unless you know how to write detailed analysis. And therefore, if you feel like what you need more help with is how to structure your paragraphs and how to write analysis, you need to look at my other videos that are gonna help you with those skills as well. You can also have a look at my playlist for the Edexcel IGCSE for my videos on the other texts that come up across this course. See you later.